The subtitle here we have is People Who Can Speak But Don't. And just because we can speak, it doesn't mean that we're going to speak in every situation. We're all very familiar with, with that idea. No one wants to make a fool of themselves by saying the wrong thing. Um, many of us are going to feel shy or awkward in social situations. It will take us time to warm up. And some of us hate small talk and we will actively avoid conversations which to us are quite pointless. So we've all got this idea that, OK, so it's not so bad, surely. I don't talk all the time. You don't have to. But very, very few of us will know what it feels like to have selective mutism, to, to know exactly what you want to say and wish you could say it. But in that, just that horrible heart-pounding moment, nothing will come out. You just feel frozen. How can that be a choice? How can anybody possibly choose to feel like that? But that is still the, the feeling, the attitude so often around children, young people, adults who have selective mutism, that they are choosing to be like this. So what I'm saying here is there are lots of reasons why people are quiet, why they don't always speak, and selective mutism is just one of those reasons. But because it's the explanation which probably we are the least familiar with, we, most people have the, the least understanding of that explanation, that's the reason that people don't think about. And in the absence of any other explanation, unfortunately, people will jump to all sorts of conclusions about why a person is not speaking. And as we'll see as the talk goes on, that can have very serious consequences. So the main focus of the talk today is, is, is about having that understanding of what selective mutism actually is, so that we don't jump to these conclusions. We don't think, oh, they don't want to talk. They're choosing not to. They're just being difficult. Oh, they're just shy. Oh, they're autistic. We want to have that understanding so that rather than jump to those conclusions and handle the situation completely inappropriately and make it much worse for that individual, instead we'll be able to um, provide an environment that is welcoming, that is accepting of that person, that will enable them to flourish. That's all we could want for any of us. We can enable them to flourish with just a few simple techniques and accommodations. If everybody knew all of these simple things that we could do, we wouldn't have any need for specialists. I would love it if I never ever had to work with someone who had selective mutism again. I would feel, yes, <laughs> great. Unfortunately, people don't have that understanding. So that's the main focus, but I will start with a little bit of background. It used to be called elective mutism. Back in the 80s, it was defined as persistent refusal to speak. And it was firmly believed that individuals with this condition were choosing not to speak. By the 90s, this definition had been completely overhauled as it was understood now that there, there was no choice involved here. Um, it was not deliberate. Um, th this situation arose and it was strongly associated with anxiety. The actual links were not fully understood at that time, but there was no doubt this was not deliberate. It was associated with anxiety. But still, I'm afraid today, an awful lot of people do still think it's choice, choosing not to speak. And who can blame them with this stupid name, selective mutism? It was called, it was changed from elective to selective with the idea that people would then realise that it wasn't somebody electing to 
remain silent. They were trying to show it's not choice. Instead, this form of mutism only occurs in very specific situations. Selective also means specific. But who's going to realise that? Not a lot of people would think of that other meaning of the word selective, that it just refers to very specific situations. It just sounds like the person is selecting which situations that they will speak in. So the name itself is not helpful. And I can hardly blame people for getting the wrong end of the stick here. A lot of, of um, people have tried to get it changed to situational mutism. And I think that is a, is a fairer... Um, description. So if we look at the definition here in a little bit more detail, it now talks about consistent failure to speak. So not refusal, but just it doesn't happen. So I very much try to encourage people not to use the word won't, he or she won't speak, because that implies that it's a deliberate act. It's, it's judgmental to say won't. It we just need to describe the situations where they talk, the situations where they don't talk, and just keep it to a factual description of, of what's actually happening. This cons these, every single word I've highlighted there is important. Consistent. It is very, very consistent. There is always this utterly predictable pattern of the situations where the individual manages to speak and the situations where they don't. Now, the fact that it is very specific, that makes it very different to mood disorders, anything that's emotional. Um, it, they are much more unpredictable and really do depend on, on whether you're having a good day or a bad day, on how you're feeling. But this is nothing to do with that. These situations can be so specific. I think a lot of people confuse the idea of specific situations with specific people, that the, the child, uh, the young person, the adult can talk to some people but not others. Now, to some extent that's true, but it's all down to the situation. So, for example, a child might be able to speak um, with their parents um, freely and easily and happily as long as no one else is listening. But as soon as somebody else comes into the room or somebody approaches them in the street, they will stop. So it's not that just that they can't talk to their... Um, whether they can or can't talk to this person, it's whether anyone else is listening. It's that specific. It, it can be specific in as much as it can be down to I might be able to manage to respond this will be with different individuals. Not every personality um, is like this. But a lot of children find that with certain people, they can manage to respond. Just one word, two words. It's clearly effortful for them because their voices do not sound natural. They'll be very quiet or strained. They may evil even use alternative um, voices. Whispering, for example they can only respond. That's how specific it is. They won't be able to initiate. So some people will say about the children, it's not consistent. They speak to me sometimes but not others. If you look at the whole situation, you'll realise it is very consistent. It will depend on who else is in the room, who else is listening, whether you asked a question and the child was able to respond, or whether you were expecting the child to go up and ask you something. Okay. Consistent failure to speak in specific social situations where speaking is expected. And that's quite crucial because sometimes people will say to me, but no speech is expected. You know, we've all agreed, you know, we're not going to um, ask questions here. Um, but all the time a child feels it's expected, that will affect them. So it's not just whether you expect it or not, it's the perception of the individual. And it's that sense of, oh, I'm going to have to say something, I'm going to have to do something here. It actually just puts them into avoidance mode and they just don't want to go 
into that situation in the first place because they feel they will be expected. So I always say to teachers, look, if you've made a decision that you're not going to, for the moment, choose a child to read aloud in front of the class or answer a question, you're not going to pick them, you've got to let the child know that, that you're not going to, that it's up to them. If they want to answer, that's great, but it's up to them to put their hand up or give a little sign or something to let the teacher know that I, want, I really feel I can do this, I want to be chosen now. Um, if you don't let them know that, they're just going to sit there waiting for the next time they're going to be asked. There are a few exclusions here. We do have to make, before we ever call this kind of silence selective mutism, do make sure it is not just a consistent pattern, but a very persistent situation. So this pattern you're seeing has gone on for at least one month. And if the child is in a new environment, in a nursery, in a new school, um, then you would discount that first month because a lot of children are, don't say much in the first few weeks, but hardly any children would say nothing after two months. Okay, so we have to make sure it's gone on for long enough to actually call it selective mutism. Because as I say, there are lots of reasons why children don't talk. It's not always selective mutism. And we do have to rule out other explanations. You know, I think we could well understand a child might not say anything if, for example, they haven't understood the question or if they, are, they don't have the vocabulary to answer the question. Um, that would be a good explanation for their silence. With selective mutism, it's when, no, you've ruled out all of those other things. The child does know exactly what to say. They've done this game a million times at home. They love it. They play it with certain friends, but then suddenly when their teacher comes to join in or another new friend, another child from class comes to join in, suddenly they're not saying anything now. It's that change as you move from people who, let's say, are in your comfort zone, that you find these are the people that you've grown up with usually, that you have lots of contact with, you've had, um, you, you, know what it's, you know that feeling of, of just normal, free, comfortable, happy um, interaction, but it's about moving outside that comfort zone. And as you meet new people, something is happening that is stopping you from speaking. In um, 2013, these definitions were overhauled again, but no change was made to the description of selective mutism. It is still described as a consistent failure to speak. The only difference now is that it is classified as an anxiety disorder. Previously, it was just known as a, a, um, a disorder that um, started in childhood or adolescence. I think here too is a, is a bit of a reason for common misperception. People will often talk about selective mutism as being an anxiety disorder and so then often I get the reaction from um, relatives or from staff, oh he's not anxious, look at him. How can you say he's an anxious child? Um, and we have to remember, if we look through the, the list of anxiety disorders, we can recognise that just because you have one of these conditions does not mean you're anxious all the time. You're, in most of the cases here, you are just anxious when a certain trigger triggers your anxiety reaction, a feeling of panic. If I... You know, um, I can think of anxieties I have which you won't, you'd never even know about because I'm not in that situation where I'm expected to do those things. So with anxiety, it only occurs in very specific situations where you dread a certain thing is about to happen. Okay, I think we need to hear from people who've actually lived with selective mutism themselves. Um, I have written a manual, um, as, as, uh, as Jim mentioned, but I could not have done it unless I had absolutely immersed myself in, in, fam in families' lives, unless I'd actually spoken at length to young people, worked um, and socialised with adults who have selective mutism. 
And so we do need to hear, I'm going to introduce you first to um, Kelly and Rachel. And they are going to tell you how it felt for them. In fact, at this point, Kelly still does have selective mutism. I didn't meet Kelly until she was 12 and she's about 15 here and she is still working her way through it. With Rachel, uh, she got her help eight to nine years of age and she was over it by the time she went to secondary school and she's 23 here talking about her memories. It's like this absolutely horrible feeling where you'd almost rather die than have to utter a word in front of certain people. These children are almost like two children rolled into one. They will be a perfectly noisy, happy, boisterous child at home, but in school they're quiet, reserved, tight. They want to speak. It's not that the fact that they don't want to. They'd love to, but it's this angst usually is built up to such a degree that it just doesn't out. Well, I think it really helps just to be understanding and just try to help. The older you get, the, the more you get set into this role of being the child that doesn't speak and, and the more it is built up and, and, you know, the more attention there is drawn to the fact, the bigger it is and, and the more scary it becomes to actually break free from that, from that sort of label and role that you've got given. Well, one of the leaders at Brownies used to bully me a bit, I suppose. She didn't really understand why I wasn't talking. Sometimes I would talk, sometimes I wouldn't, so she thought I was just being naughty. So she used to take me in the other room and have a go at me and say, go in there and talk. And it got to the point where I was scared to go and I was having headaches every Monday. When you're feeling like so afraid of it that your whole body feels like it's physically frozen inside, you don't want somebody to be pushing you to do that because there's nothing worse in the world than the thought of having to speak. Okay, so Kelly and Rachel have added something to this now. We're not now just thinking about a description of what happens, that with some people you can speak completely freely and naturally and easily, but in other situations you can't. We're not just talking about a pattern of talking. This goes alongside this terrible feeling inside. I talked about a heart racing moment. It is, it is a feeling of absolute panic. Um, Rachel said she'd almost rather die than have to utter a word. Kelly talks about being so afraid of it. And the ridiculous thing is you don't even know what it is you're afraid of. It makes no sense to you. You want to talk to Brown Owl. You don't want to look an idiot and stand there and the only one who can't say anything. You want to please your teacher. Nobody wants this. And you don't understand why it's happening to you. This is why we must talk to the children about what is happening. Explain it to them as well. But instead, we keep asking them why they're not talking. Why don't you just have a go? They don't know. They wish they could. It, it is, it's terrifying for them. Rachel spoke about being so frozen inside and it's this feeling of everything is still. I can't kind of move. I can't move my mouth muscles. I can't move my throat muscles. I can barely breathe. It's that feeling. It's, it's panic is, is the only word and it's what happens to us when we're caught in the middle of, of that um, fight, flight, freeze moment. It's an automatic fear reflex. It is triggered and there's nothing you can do about it. And you know that what I am talking about here, what I'm describing, an irrational fear that you can't do anything about, you wish you could go get over it, but you can't, so instead you just avoid it, it's a phobia. That's what this is, it's a phobia of speaking to new people as you meet them, people who are not in your comfort zone. I won't have time to go into how this all develops. I'm just going to pick out some key points. It's a very short talk that we are doing today. But all I will say is, of course, like any other phobia, it's nobody's fault. There is nobody to blame for this. They just happen. But in most cases, 
We know it's a phobia, we understand it's a genuine fear, and we are completely accepting of it. We get it, we understand. We might not get it in the sense of, well, you know, how could anyone have a phobia of bananas, but all right, if that's your phobia, or buttons, that's a very common one, actually. Um, but we understand what phobias are, and we know you can have a phobia of literally anything. So we do get it in that sense. We know that this person is experiencing a real fear, and therefore they will dread going into that situation. So although there's nothing real to be afraid of, there is no real threat, the feelings you are getting, the panic reaction, are utterly real. It's horrible, and your brain is telling you, get out of this situation, keep yourself safe, avoid. Now, unfortunately, that need to avoid is going to make it look like this is deliberate, because you'll do all you can to get out of those situations that trigger your phobia. I, I found this really useful when I read it from, on an adult blog many years ago now. I have selective mutism, but I don't agree that it's extreme anxiety causing it. If anything, it's the other way around. Mutism causes the extreme anxiety. It's terrifying not being able to say what you need to say. That just sums it up completely. It's not anxiety that causes it. It's not that the fact that these children are scared of their teachers, anxious you know, around their classmates. Often these children love their schools. They love their work. They want to get on. This is why I say it makes no sense to them, because they don't necessarily go into a situation full of anxiety about that situation. But what does make them anxious is the trigger of, oh, that person expects me to speak. And suddenly I've got that horrible flood of intense anxiety and panic. And yes, terrifying not being able to say what you need to say. These are the points really that Kelly and Rachel are making for us. And this is what I've just been going through. We've talked about this need to avoid, and of course that is the classic characteristic of all phobias. You manage it by avoidance. Unfortunately, and very sadly, this desperate need for avoidance is going to render these students more and more invisible for the, lo the longer this goes on. They will start to avoid certain people that push their buttons. They won't want to meet this particular set of grandparents if these particular grandparents always expect please thank you hellos and think it's rude if you don't whereas if the other set of grandparents who are just very laid back and are happy to do all the talking and say hey i've got a great game here let's do this together actually they're going to get a lot more talking because they're not putting that expectation on you not that demand they're allowing you to relax feel socially comfortable first and then you face that fear at your own pace and these children if they can speak at their own pace in tiny steps they'll get there they will be fine it's just allowing them to do that but if that's not the situation they will try to avoid they will physically avoid by head down the curtains the hoodies the that's where we get this this not making eye contact they will experience that the minute they make eye contact with somebody it's almost like an invitation to that person to say oh hi how are you doing and oh my god it's a question i'm expected to say hello now so they will break the eye contact they will plead not to go somewhere and when that doesn't when they say i don't want to go to school when that doesn't work suddenly you find they can't find their reading bag and they're not getting dressed in you know and there's all sorts of reasons they'll invent they are so inventive they'll come up with one reason after another all about avoidance but we all know that our self-esteem is you know part of what um, gives us this confidence and inner resilience is a feeling of social acceptance and being able to have make social connections is what is so validating for all of us 
And people who have selective mutism, the longer this goes on, they are being deprived of that. To me, this is worse than sleep deprivation or as bad as. So it's not necessarily about having loads of friends. Not everyone chooses to have loads of friends, but we all make social connections. And if you're deprived of that, that is going to seriously um, have a psychological effect on you. And the, old, the older the children become, without this being treated, you're dealing with more than just selective mutism. You've now got secondary psychological issues where you are feeling rejected, you feel you're a failure, you're feeling useless. You're beginning to believe what everyone is saying about you. There is something wrong with you. No, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just a phobia, you know? Um, my caseload of um, teenagers, whenever I've had late referrals, when I looked at my caseload once and I looked at all of the children who had not been referred until they were 15 or more, so very late referrals, all of those teenagers were either self-harming or school refusing, but it's school avoidance, really, rather than refusing. Or they were on medication for um, anxiety um, or depression, or a combination of these things. And, and this is why this is a safeguarding issue. We've got to educate the general public about this. Everyone needs to know about this. Because if you can deal with it early, it doesn't have to come to that. I know so many people, so many, where they were lucky enough to get the right help, the right support, the right accommodations made very early on, and it's gone. It was just a phobia, and they worked their way through it. So <coughs> these, on, I would, I'll let you look through these on your handouts, but up here I've, I've listed some diagnostic features that are unique to selective mutism. These are the things that help us see. This is very different to shyness. This is very different to autism. It's very different to a communication disorder or a deliberate choice not to speak. And I think this classic thing that you can be talking very, very happily to your friends or family and then you freeze when you notice someone approaching, that's very classic to selective mutism. You don't see that in shyness or autism or anything else. Do people outgrow selective mutism? I don't believe anyone outgrows any type of fear. I believe you work your way through it. And so it all depends on the support you get. Because if you think about it, if you have a fear of something, if everybody just made you more and more afraid of that thing because of the way they were behaving, why would you grow out of it? You might grow out of it much later when you distance yourself from those people and do some reading yourself and realise that actually what those people were saying was completely unjustified. And so, yes, you can do some self-help. And of course, you can work through something on your own as well, but it's about working through it. It isn't just a maturational thing that you grow out of it. Okay. So this means there is no guarantee. And that's why I say this is a safeguarding issue. We have to take this seriously. Because as I've explained with the teenagers that I've met, and I know from the adults who've kindly contributed chapters to as, uh, two books um, out here, which have got adults um, chapters written by adults, you know, we know from them, um, there is no guarantee that this is going to go. It's all down to how we understand and, and support, give appropriate support. Um, these are just some facts and figures, um, and, I, and I think this really just shows that selective mutism is not as rare as a lot of people think. It's not rare at all, and undoubtedly these figures are underestimates. So what can we do? This is the important thing. Well, essentially, we are going to treat this like a phobia. A lot of you will know this book. This is such a famous book. So much good stuff in it. It is about you feel the fear, but you do it anyway. So it's about learning that when you feel anxiety, when you feel fear, that's not a stop signal. That doesn't mean run away from it, avoid, because the longer you put something off, the more you avoid it, that just the bigger that anxiety gets. 
So, as with any phobia, what we're aiming to do with selective mutism is get in there early. I've known children who, when people started changing the way they were behaving towards those children, um, at, at preschool, by the time, certainly by year one, by the time they were five, five and a half, they were over it. People got in very early and you just manage it appropriately. But it is never too late to make a massive difference to anybody's life who has got selective mutism. It's never too late. So yes, nip it in the bud if you can, but if already this young person has had experienced and lived this for a long time, you can still apply all the techniques and support them to start to work through it. Now, okay, they may have developed other anxieties by now as well, which is going to need a separate type of intervention, but as in terms of the selective mutism, just for them knowing what they're dealing with and actually being able to focus on, right, that bit's the SM, these bits I've acquired along the way and I'm not surprised I, got, I feel like that be because of this SM. It's got a lot to answer for. As with any phobia, you have to understand it and that means not just us, but the child needs to understand it. The adult needs to understand it. And that means we need to talk openly about it. So many families have said to me that they don't like to mention it in case it makes things worse. Um, they don't want to embarrass the child or whatever. But this child is desperate to know and understand what's going on. And they normally look to the adults for support. We need to give them that support. And treat it and talk about it in the way you would talk about any fear that child might have. They, you know, a fear of jumping in the deep end, a fear of letting go at the top of the slide. Obviously, when you do anything for the first time, it is scary, but you can build up to it a little bit at a time. Help the person face that fear one tiny step at a time at their own pace. So in other words, there is no pressure to talk. And that, people feel is ironic, but the less you expect them to talk, the more likely they are to be able to. And for me, this is the real starting point. What we're going to do is support participation rather than avoidance. So often we're putting pressure on without realising it by trying to encourage the child to talk more or just saying, how did you get on today? Did you manage to do it? Did you speak? This is all making me feel, oh, I've really got to try harder. And I'm just getting my anxiety up. The more I try, the harder it gets. Um, so, I'm, so actually what's happening is that people are making it more likely that I'm going to want to avoid this situation because the, I'm feeling pressure here. And funnily enough, praise is a form of pressure. A lot of teenagers have said, oh, I just can't stand it when they praise me. Because they know that when they get praise, it just really means, lovely, now you can do it again. I want more of that, please. You know, they're not stupid. They know that praise just means, yep, we want more of that. So they feel under pressure and they feel they are disappointing their parents, letting their teachers down, letting the people they admire the most down. So we've got to be very, very careful as far as that's concerned. In other words, what you're picking up is there's a lot of things we do that inadvertently maintain, strengthen the child, the young person's fear. And so it's just about us learning how not to put the pressure on. So what we do instead is just support participation. This is all about inclusion, making it possible for that young person, that child, that adult to just be there without any pressure on you, just letting people know we would just love to have you there. Just come and watch, just come and listen, just come and stay for a short time. We would love to have you there. It's, it's a, that's the first step, participation, being there. From that, when you feel socially comfortable, that is your starting point and we can move into speaking. So, effective intervention involves these three main areas, education for everybody, families, relatives, the young person themselves, staff in schools, the swimming instructor, the music teacher, it, it is everybody. It's the receptionist at the dental 
um, surgery, etc. It's got to be about education. And then once through that general education, we are able to welcome these children, these adults, into an environment and make sure they feel socially comfortable, then yes, a small steps approach, knowing how we can help support the individual to just nudge their way through a small steps progression. With every phobia, it's about just getting there in small steps, but I've got to do it when I feel ready. You can't just make me go and stroke that dog now because you think now's a good time. No, 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 I'll stroke it. I'll stroke that dog when I'm ready. And the more you make me know, can you see, I'm actually backing into a corner here. So, but we do need to know and understand what those small steps are. So I've got handouts for all of these things um, in, in your handout pack. And finally, it's about emotional um, support. And what I would really like to do um, is play a video there that adults who have selective mutism made, they wrote the words for it. Um, they, ha they, have a, um, they are part of a peer support group in Canterbury, uh, near where I live. And if I had to pick out just one word, and that's the word that's on your handouts, one aspect of emotion that they needed, it was acceptance. That was what they wanted to feel more than anything. When they come to the group, they all said, no, I didn't come here to try and get better. I kind of, it's not about that anymore. It's, I just, I want to be able to live with this and deal with it and not feel so excluded. And to come to this group where I feel just, I'm not being judged, I'm just accepted. That's what's made the biggest difference for all of them. So we'll finish on that. So in the education section, I've included in your handouts a list of maintaining factors to show you how subtle some of these things can be. Um, either pressure or avoidance, both of these, these things will maintain selective mutism. I've also included here the sorts of things to say. Um, these are mainly to children here. Just the way that we can just very casually talk about selective mutism in exactly the same way as if the child had a fear of the darkness, a fear of dogs, swimming, whatever. So these are just um, expressions and how we can just bring this more into just open, everyday conversation. As um, children get older, we just explain to them about phobias. We can talk to them as I am talking to you today. Be ready to deal with unhelpful comments from their peers. The children don't mean to be nasty, but it can feel to the child that they are. The, the other, their peers will genuinely say, why doesn't she talk, miss? Or, don't, don't ask him, he can't talk. He won't say anything, they'll say to the new supply teacher. Don't ask Daniel, he doesn't talk. Um, and these things aren't helpful at all. So we need to be ready with quick replies so that we can just play it right down and show, look, we're not phased by this. It is not a big deal and you shouldn't be phased by it either. There is a booklet that is um, available... I've given you a couple of website addresses there. This booklet is designed much more for, um, I would say, the sort of older teenagers and adults. In fact, it was written um, three adults who um, have selective mutism um, helped me to write this. I could not, of course, I could not have done this without them. So, and so this is, is a, a good website to go to, and that's where you, you can download this leaflet there. Also, this website, um, Finding Our Voices, there are wonderful newsletters there with lots of contributions by a lot of teenagers who have selective mutism. And I think get it, this is part of emotional support, finding peers that you can talk to who understand what you're going through. But this booklet is... Um, it very much talks about how it is a phobia um, and gives it, it also talks about how it messes with your mind and makes you start believing things that just aren't true about yourself and it gives tips for how to deal with it. And I would say that's a very good booklet to show other professionals um, because I, unfortunately a, you'll come across a lot of professionals in mental health services, in speech and language therapy services, just generally in health and education, who will not have come across selective mutism and have got no idea um, how to handle it. So that's a good informative booklet. 
It's one of the downloads in the Selective Mutism Resource Manual, and I've got that here. You can see um, here all the downloads. When you buy the manual, you actually get these um, photocopyable materials as an online resource, and in there, there would be a copy of that booklet as well. But as I say, you can get it at the other websites. And I've included in your handouts an example of one of the um, uh, handouts. This one, Selective Mutism is a Phobia. Okay. Again, I think useful for pro professionals is just to know that on NHS Choices there is information um, about Selective Mutism there. And it very much includes, it's not just about children anymore, we talk about adults there. Um, it's so important that, you know, I, I think that has been wrong for years, that people have felt this is just something that happens to children. It's not. It's just as important that colleges and universities have all of this information so that they can um, include students um, in their studies. So key pieces of advice for education, and these, what I mean, are just the, the kind of simple techniques that any of us could do First of all, it, when, I, it, when we've talked about participation, helping the children be part of activities, now clearly this means we're going to talk to them. So I'm not saying don't talk to the children. All I am saying is please master the art, initially at least, of avoiding any direct questions. It's that that triggers the phobia. When suddenly someone asks you something and pauses, they're waiting for a reaction. That's that expectation to speak. But of course we talk to the students, the adults. Um, but what we're doing is keeping a running commentary going. Ah, oh, well, if you'd like to come with me, I'll, I'll show you where everything is. Right. Ah, oh, good. I'm glad to see you've brought that with you. That's going to be really useful. OK, so this is where we do this. Now, you see what I mean? I'm, I'm just keeping a flow of talking going. Obviously, I'm going to pause um, at the natural places. And I'm going to use some questions. I'm going to use rhetorical questions. And these are the questions that don't, no answers expected. If you can throw in a lot of rhetorical questions. Um, I've had adults say to me, I really felt I was answering you. And the thing about a good rhetorical question, it doesn't expect an answer, but the other person is answering in their head. So it feels like real interaction. So there's two sorts of rhetorical questions. The first sort is the tag question. So whatever you say, just tag it with that question. Oh, this looks good, doesn't it? I bet you've got one of these, haven't you? Um, I know, we could sit down here, couldn't we? So whatever you say, you can always tag it with a question. And in your head, the person with you saying, oh, yeah, we could actually, or, yeah, you're right, yeah, I have got one of those. Yeah, you're right, no, that's awful, isn't it? You know, it, it feels already like you're engaging. So rhetorical questions and also those kind of I wonder questions. You're actually asking yourself the question, oh, I wonder what on earth this is? Oh, how does this work? So it's, and you're not looking at the person you're with, you're looking at the object. And very often that's when kids will say, oh, give it here, I'll sort it out. Because they can't bear watching you struggle and getting it all wrong. But you haven't actually asked them to speak. So, so often it's when there is no expectation to speak, that's when they feel relaxed enough to, suddenly the anxiety drops. And then, of course, they'll speak naturally. It's just a matter of getting the anxiety low enough to stop that panic reaction so that the muscles relax and out comes their voice again. Smile. That's my next tip. This is so important. It's probably, my, probably the most important. So often we want to help so much. We're desperate to help, but we're worried we're going to say the wrong thing. Or um, we're so worried, oh no, someone's asked my child a question. Oh God, what's going to happen now? Oh, how is... Oh, well, they think he's, you know, and we just go into a concerned expression. Now, children will not read that. It will always look, oh, I'm upsetting them, or someone's cross. Or, I mean, one three-year-old said to her mum, am I making you sad, mummy? Now, mum was just worried about her daughter. But that's too, that is much too subtle an emotion for a three-year-old to read. And I actually think for 15 and 16-year-olds and most of us, if you've got no context, it's too subtle to read. 
So a furrowed brow, a, a look of worry and concern, when you knit your brows, it looked, you either look basically cross or sad. So if you put on a, even a fake smile, actually you start to feel better as well. It's weird how it works. And there are stages, and I've, I've got all the details on your handouts, but this is a very important stage. The more somebody who's got selective mutism can just let their voice out in public, not by talking to you directly, but maybe they're talking to their friend or their partner or their parent. They've got their voice out, and even though that person there can hear it, oh my goodness, the world has not fallen in. It is still okay. Because this is how phobias work. You honestly, for this completely irrational reason, you just feel something really bad will happen if I do this thing. So if you can test the water in this way, and if we can just allow these children space to talk comfortably to their parents, to their friends, to whoever, and not, want to, not butt in there and start joining in with them, that is going to really help them. Okay, I just want to show you, this is literally one minute of video, and this is the difference that just being nice can make. Because basically, that's the main technique, isn't it? Just be nice. Um, this, you can watch the whole of this on YouTube. So if you just go on YouTube and search One Show Selective Mutism, you'll come up with this. It's a six-minute edited clip from the One Show. But for now, I, I've just got a minute. This is a young woman, Nicola. She was 20 when this was filmed. She um, had not um, had any success uh, with support services. Um, and that's why her father made this. It was really to highlight the lack of support that was available for children and young people. And she'd had an absolutely miserable time. She'd not been able to engage with any of the, um, the health services and the mental health services that were trying to engage with her because of the way they were treating her. That was why she couldn't engage, because they were triggering the phobia all the time. But the reporter on this show, he was just fantastic. He just found out all about it. He asked advice, so how should I approach Nicola? Or you think email to start with, okay, that's fine. I, I'm, a me I'm shocked at how many mental health services will not accept email conversations. That's actually kind of, I'm being filmed, so I've got to be careful what I say. But I <laughs> kind of illegal. I'm sure there's a rule about it. I know in the NICE guidelines it says that if you have an anxiety disorder, you have to allow the client to choose their mode of communication, their preferred mode of communication. That is the NICE guidelines for social anxiety disorder. So maybe illegal is a bit strong. But anyway, this guy emailed Nicola, they set it up. And she almost didn't make this day. Her dad set up a training day. So there's lots of teachers there have come for training day. Um, I was running the training day. And for Nicola to be there to participate was massive for her because she has to fight back this fear. Somebody will expect me to talk. While the session's in progress. Nicola arrives with her family for support. As she doesn't have a voice, it's easy to assume she doesn't have opinions either. But don't be fooled. We emailed her our questions and she's answered. I suppose the first thing I asked you was, was how you feel about having selective mutism. You've been very honest, you've said you feel depressed, isolated and different to everybody else like an outsider. I asked how do you react to people who just tell you to start talking? Were you right? I felt upset and angry and wanted them to understand more and realise it wasn't a choice not to speak, it was an anxiety disorder, and that I wasn't doing it for attention, like people have said in the past. And we can see her anxiety written all over her face. She was so brave to come to this, but I'm now going to show you a two-second clip, and this is Nicola at the end of the day. She, after doing this bit in the library at the school, she did manage after lunch to actually come in to the main hall and sit at the back 
uh, with her parents and listen to the end of the talk and listen to the questions that came from the staff um, who were attending. And just the look on her face says it all. This is the sweetest thing ever. And it's, t it's like a different person. And Lindsay, um, the chairman of Smyra, she said this right at the beginning of the day. It is almost like having two different children. And it's whether the anxiety is there and the panic is there or <sighs> it's gone. It's a lovely, lovely moment and she can be proud of herself. So I'm really skimming now the small steps approach is about understanding two small steps progressions, the stages of one-to-one -one interaction, which, as I've already said, starts with social comfort and participation. And this is on page eight of your handouts. It looks like this. It goes into all the detail. But on your next slide, that just summarises those eight stages. And it's about helping individuals speak to one person at a time to start with. So it's much easier for them to start to relate to one person when there's not lots of other people listening. Unless it's their friend who they talk to easily or their parent who's with them, that's fine. But if you've got people who you don't usually speak to also watching you, there's always, always this worry. Well, if they hear me talk to this person, they'll expect me to talk to them as well and I'm not quite ready for that. So it just puts your anxiety up. Um, we go from participation to nonverbal communication. Communicating without talking, pointing, nodding, shaking your head. This is wonderful. It's fantastic that we're now starting to engage and be able to communicate. So whenever a child gestures to you, respond back as if they've spoken. That's another way of making the child feel, or adult, it makes you feel like they have said something to you. Because you're when they sort of point at something, you just say, oh, yes, I hadn't noticed that. Thank you. Wow, that looks interesting. And it's like you're responding to what they've said. So just accept gesture as a, as a, a really good form of communication. It's not about stopping them at that point. As soon as they feel relaxed enough, they'll be able to move on and go further. Talking through others. I've already talked about that talking bridge where you talk to other people and allow that person to hear your voice. It's also a lovely stage when I can talk to you, but actually I'm going to go via my mum or I'm going to tell my friend, knowing full well he's going to come and tell you. Now that is another step forward. It's me learning that you are not going to say, well, thank you very much, Johnny, but I think Daniel can tell me himself. I'm learning to trust you because you're cool about this. So that's a very important stage. Just relaxing enough to let your voice out with this person is now the next step. This is just about allowing your voice to come. There's no, in, no actual verbal interaction here. This is not about having a conversation. It's just about relaxing enough to laugh. So any games, any activities where you just forget what you're doing, you're just having fun and there's lots of wheeze and whoa and ah, you know, just through having fun, anything like that may well help to relax you enough so that voice starts to come. It's going to be a very important stage. And a kazoo is a really handy musical instrument to throw in after you've blown on the recorder or the sucked on the mouth organ and made sounds then just a kazoo, you would actually have to hum. But we wouldn't say, make sure you hum, I want to hear your voice here, because that's pressure. That shows that, oh God, all they want is for me to talk. Ah, okay. Something that I think people do find a bit um, more surprising is that reading aloud, counting, anything that you've learned off by heart, any sort of chanting, is a stage five, it's just voice. Because all you're having to think about is letting your voice out. You're not having to think about the words. You're not having to think about what will the person say next and then is this answer gonna be acceptable and how much more have I got to talk? It's just 
you're much more in control of this. It's just something that you, you, you know, you can say it automatically. I've just got to keep relaxed enough to allow my voice to flow. So this would only, when I say reading aloud, this would only be for confident readers. But that's often a very good way in, particularly with older children, um, young people, to, to go in through reading. And then, there, I've given you in your handouts a way that you can just gently, gently change that reading aloud into two-way interaction, interaction and eventually conversation. Um, we then have single words, a few more, a phrase, a sentence, until connected sentences. And after that, it's generalisation, bringing in more people, talking in smaller group, in a small group of people, tolerating other people in the background, hearing your voice more and more. OK, so that's not the end of the journey. It's the start. But the younger you start this process, the quicker the child will generalise. There is another progression, which is about communication risk. So the details are here. Make sure that to start with, you choose low-risk anxiety, um, low-risk activities, because they will provoke a lot less anxiety. Things that are predictable, the child is sure they'll get it right, that will provoke a lot less anxiety than a high communication risk activity. I've already talked a little bit about the graded question sequence, so I'm just going to draw your attention to this last handout, and then we're going to watch this ad the video that the adults made. But the, the, all the rest of the techniques that I've got in the PowerPoint handout, you will find them in this last handout. It, will, it comes, it's pages 9 to 12 of the, the handout you receive, informal techniques. On page 1, we've, we've got this graded question sequence. Now, I've already said rhetorical questions are the start of the sequence. So you don't ask any direct questions, just rhetorical questions. And then you take it from the individual, the child, the young person, the adult. As they seem to respond to that and begin to participate, join in, join in with the activity, come and sit down with you, whatever you, the, in, the activity involves, you can then try the next type of question, which is a, a question that would be a yes, no question or a which of these do you fancy doing first? So the only response we're looking for is nodding, shaking, pointing. As soon as they can do that, you try the next one, which is an X or Y question. And I remember one little girl, my very first question I asked her, you've got to make it X or Y. It is so much easier than saying, what's that? Or what colour is that? Or what's your name? It just <gasps> freezes you. But we were drawing together. She was already doing nonverbal responses. And she had done a lovely drawing of her dog. And I just said, oh, gosh, this is beautiful. I love this bit here. I said, is that a necklace or a collar? And OK, you know it's a collar, but an eight-year-old was fine with that question. It didn't feel patronising to her. And she just she told me it was a collar. And after, after that, she'd released a word. Now, I didn't straight away ask another question. I went back. And this is why you've got these two arrows here. You push forward, you nudge with the question. Once they've answered, they might go into a little bit of a panic of, oh, oh, I don't normally do that, oh dear, this might go too far. So it's always wise, just pull back a little bit now, go back to some rhetoricals and some non-verbals, but then push on again. And once you've had two or three of these X, y, X or Y successes, you go on to the next type of question and so on. So that is a technique. OK, you, you do need to think about it and practice it to start with, but I promise you it becomes so natural. And I use this with everyone who has selective mutism that I meet, and they don't feel therapt. They, they can't tell I'm doing it, because it, you, it is about doing it naturally, but you, you do need to practice. OK. Um, so, as I say, these are all the informal techniques. I'm... I, what I'll do is go into more detail of these techniques if people want to ask questions about them later on. But for now, let's finish with this video. Emotional support is so important. They have been so deprived of support and people often treat them as if they're doing something wrong. This is so important. Um, this video, as I say, it was made by members of SM Talking Circles in Canterbury. We, there is also a group in London. And you've got the email address if you want more in information. 
It always makes me emotional watching this, um, and I think you will see why. This is a daily reality for those of us who experience selective mutism. Selective mutism usually begins in early childhood. It used to be assumed that the condition resolved spontaneously as the child grew up. Sadly, we now know that this is not the case. A trapped and isolated group of adults exist who cannot alert others to their plight. Because they are imprisoned by silence in public places. When you can't use speech to freely communicate with the world on a daily basis, your life opportunities are restricted and you cannot discover your true identity. We are misunderstood, unseen and unheard. There are no services out there to meet our needs. SM Talking Circles provides face-to-face -face peer support to this group of adults for the first time in the UK. Often, the first question that people ask is, how do you run a peer group with a group of people who don't talk? The first answer is simple. There is absolutely no pressure to speak during our meetings. Secondly, we use a structured approach which allows members to release their voices and make small steps towards talking freely within the group. Most importantly, this is what the members of SM Talking Circles have to say.